tonight. We're going to be continuing our series called Verse Thief. And we've been looking at verses in the Bible that are often taken out of context. Often these verses are used and twisted to say something that the Scripture is not meaning or not intending to say, or God intending to say through the Scriptures. One of my favorite things about this series so far, we've been in here now uh, for a few weeks, but one of my favorite things has been your participation in it. Because several times I've had people come to me and say, what about this verse? Is this verse taken out of context? Or can we talk about this verse? Because that's often taken out of context. So I've really appreciated that. That The goal would be to give y'all some the tools to look at Scripture and be discerning. And look, when somebody's teaching, say, you know what, that doesn't sound right. That, 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 that's not, that, that's, I don't think that's what Scripture is saying. And that's the goal in, in looking at a lot of these verses. Uh, so the verse I chose tonight, talk about a verse that in theory would be a, an amazing verse, and then when you, when you go through it and begin to study it, you realize there is no way to teach it fully in one, in one week. And so I'm going to attempt to do that. So what we're going to do, this is going to be an interesting week, because I, I can't give you the full, deep context, because it's a sermon series in and of itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to paint some broad strokes tonight. We're going to see what the context of this verse is, but we're going to, we're going to have to miss a lot because it's out of the scope of it. And KU, for one, I know, are going to be sad to miss some of it because we're going to talk about the golden chain of salvation that we're going to see in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. We're going to miss some of it, but that's, that's not meaning that we're going to miss it permanently. Just for the scope of this sermon tonight, I want you to hear what Romans chapter 8, verse 29 means in context. So, if it feels like I'm passing over some major doctrines, I am. Okay? And it's just a temporary flyover. We will land in Romans 8 eventually and look at it, but um, for tonight, I really want to kind of narrow our focus down into this. This verse is most often used out of context, the way that I've seen it typically, but it's not used maliciously. I, I usually say in the series that, you know, people kind of violently kidnap these verses. This is not. This is a gentle kidnapping. People use this verse with the best intentions at heart. People want to use this verse in order to provide some measure of comfort during hard times. That's how I've seen it consistently used. Uh, but as we say each week, our goal is to pursue truth at any cost. And so when we look at this, we want to be as accurate and, and faithful to the text as we possibly can be as we're looking at this. So that's what we're going to focus on and so I'd love for us to read together Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And then we'll talk about how you've seen this used in, in different places. It says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. Uh, hopefully it'll look pretty similar to what yours says if you have something different. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. It's a very, very familiar verse to us, right? All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Let's ask our questions that we start with every week. Number one is this. How have you seen this verse used? Politically, I'll use about the first eight words. Okay. So all things work together for good. Yeah, you're right. You see that frequently without any of the, the ending part of that. That's true. Where else or how else have you seen this used? I know this is a Hobby Lobby one. You've seen this at Hobby Lobby or Mardell somewhere. A big poster or a, or a plaque or a sign on the wall that says all things. Well, something major, typically tragedy or something that happens in one life. For sure. A tragedy or, or something big happens and, and that's the way that we comfort people, right? Well, listen, all things work together for the good of those who love God. Yeah, very frequently used in that way. Any, any other ideas or any other thoughts how, how this gets used? Let's, let's kind of twist the question a little bit. What, without any kind of context, what can you make this verse say? Everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be good. God promises it. <laughs> Everything's going to be good. Right? What else can you make it say? Maybe that's it. If you have problems in your life, that means maybe that God doesn't love you. Maybe you're not Ooh, you know. let's explore that topic. Okay. <laughs> that's all you said. What you said, if things aren't going well for you, then you could use it to say the opposite. Well, maybe you're, you 
don't love God and you're not call, called according to. So then that really puts the pressure on me and you that if we love God, then things will work out. And that's a scary place to be. That, that if all the pressure goes on us for things going wrong in my life, then that means it's my fault. I, I haven't loved God enough. Either I haven't loved him enough or he hasn't loved me enough. That's a, that's a scary place. You can, you, we can make this say a lot of different things. So we're, I'm going to put an Amber Alert out on Romans 8.28. I want to take this and return it back to its proper context. And what you're going to find when you return these verses and study them in their context, you're going to find deeper and greater promises than you would in, in misappropriated ways. So let's, let's dig into this. Now let me pray for us, and then we will, we will jump into this. But we're going to dig into some, some questions about the book of Romans and the Apostle Paul who wrote these things. Let's pray. Father, we ask your guidance tonight. We ask the Holy Spirit to make this teaching evident and, and clear and transparent to us. Illuminate your word, Lord. We know that none, nothing in your word is intended to mislead us or hide the truth from us, but to reveal truth to us. And so I do ask you, Lord, as we are faithful to study scripture in context, to exposit the word faithfully, I do pray, Lord, that you bless your people. We know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so we pray, Lord, tonight that as we preach the word of God, as we preach it week by week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we pray, Lord, uh, that your people would be formed up in, in, in the instruction of Scripture and, and would become people of the book. I thank you so much for this evening, for the people here. I pray special blessings for their faithfulness. In your name, we ask these things. Amen. All right, let's ask some questions about the text, and we'll kind of dig into the book of Romans a little bit. Who wrote the book of Romans? It's not a trick. Don't, don't, I, I'm not trying to trick anybody. We can, we can find the answer really easy. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. It's literally, in my Bible, the very first word that is here. Paul. Paul, yeah. Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Really, like, 30-second uh, Cliff Notes version. Tell me, the apostle Paul, how did he go from where he started to writing the book of Romans? Where did he start is a better question. On the road to Damascus, good. So what was he doing on the road to Damascus? Why was he headed there? Isn't, isn't that crazy? I, I, that, like, I never get over the fact that when we study these books, Paul was set on the opposite course. He was going to persecute Christians. So what we read this morning in uh, Revelation chapter 1, where the Christians were being persecuted, Paul in his earlier life would have been an active part of that persecution. And one of the best things I've ever heard recently, I saw somebody write that this is, this is the story of the gospel. That the people that Paul had put to death when Paul was killed welcomed him into heaven. That's the story of the gospel. That the people who were enemies in life become connected and become reconciled in the faith that's in Christ Jesus. So Paul, he, he was saved on the road to Damascus. Not just saved. Like when you talk about testimonies, one thing is we were going through the with our new deacons, our candidates, the, the testimonies. But one of the things that so many of them said was, well, I don't have a great testimony. And I know what they mean, like, I wasn't saved out of life. I wasn't a drug addict. I didn't do all these things. I didn't get saved in prison. I wasn't the Apostle Paul that, that had the light shine on me on the road to Damascus. But church, when you look at your testimony, however benign you believe it to be, if you look and you say, I was an enemy of God, and he called me a friend, that I was, I was a rebel, and he redeemed me by his blood, every, every single one of us were walking miracles. That we were against God, our purpose set against God, our will set against God. And just like the Apostle Paul, he took hold of our hearts and he redeemed us. Everybody's got a great testimony. That's, I, I, I always want to push that with people. That God didn't waste time on anybody. He didn't say, you guys get regular testimonies, but this guy over here gets the good one. Sometimes, sometimes having the testimony of growing up in a Christian home and being raised by Christian parents, like that, that, that's one of the greatest blessings that anybody can have. So Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle. He's, he's the one that wrote this. When was it written? Uh, this, is, this is a little trickier because we don't have the actual dates of when, when Paul wrote these things. But we think it's about 56 to 57 AD. So you're talking 20 to 30 years after, after Christ's death and resurrection. He wrote this, we believe, in the city of Ephesus during his third missionary journey. This was not one of his prison epistles. You know, he wrote several of his letters from prison. This is not one of those. He wrote this on a missionary journey. 
and he wrote it during the same time frame as First and Second Corinthians. So it was kind of a block of letter writing. And isn't it amazing that just in a period of a couple years, the Apostle Paul produced Romans, First Corinthians, and Second Corinthians. Sometimes, so I started uh, on, on my second master's degree, and sometimes just getting back into the routine of writing and sitting there and reading a book and writing is just like I feel I feel so ignorant. Like I, I don't have words. I have to go back to the, the, the sword. The, the source over and over and over. But the Apostle Paul, he wrote uh, all these together at the same time. Who did he write this book to? To whom was it written? The Roman church. The Romans, yeah. The Romans, it was written to the Romans. We see this in Romans chapter 1, verse 7. He says, to all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints. There's no evidence that the Apostle Paul ever was in Rome to work with this church before uh, the church was planted. So this wasn't one of his churches. Somebody else had uh, planted this church, a church tradition, which I'm going to disagree strongly in this in this moment. Church tradition says that Peter was the bishop of the church at Rome, and that's how he became known as the, the first pope. The, the pope today is called the bishop of Rome. Um, I, I disagree strongly. There's also no evidence that Peter ever left uh, Jerusalem. So he, he very well could have lived out his ministry there. Uh, so to all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he wrote this to the, the church at Rome. He had a special love for this church. Uh, the book of Romans, uh, Martin Luther said, if every other book in the Bible dropped out and all we had left was the book of Romans, we would have enough to come to faith in Jesus Christ. It is a deeply theological book. It's one of those books that, as a pastor, very, it's very intimidating. I would rather spend the next 10 years in Revelation uh, than, than attempt to just flippantly walk through the book. Romans. It, it is a treasure for the church. We will get there. Um, I just want to prepare myself and y'all's selves before we do that. Uh, he wrote it to the Church of Rome. Why was it written? A couple of things, and we learn this right from the text. That, that's the goal, is for us to look at the text and learn it straight from the text. The first thing he wrote this for was to commend their faithfulness. This was a good church. This is not the same as 1 Corinthians. If you read through 1 Corinthians, you're going to see that that church had some issues. Like, you think that churches had problems today. No, nobody can top the church at, at, at Corinth. I mean, th there was an issue publicly in the church where a man was sleeping with either his own mother or his mother-in-law. And I'm not sure there's a better scenario there. It, I mean, that's it's worse or worse. It's, it's one of those. It was public, and people knew about it, and nobody was doing anything about it. But this book is totally different. Listen to how Paul addresses the Romans. He says, first... I thank my God through Jesus Christ. This is verse 8 of chapter 1. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. What an encouraging thing. Can you imagine if somebody wrote to the church and said, all over the world, I'm hearing about the faith at First Baptist Church in Maine. Like, I, it's spreading everywhere. There's stories being told. I mean, this is, this is an amazing thing. He also says, all the way at the end of the book in chapter 16, Chapter 16, verse 19. He says, The report of your obedience has reached everyone. Therefore, I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise about what's good and yet innocent about what's evil. So he's commending them. He's saying, this is, this is awesome. You guys were faithful. And then he also writes to warn them about false teachers. We've talked about this over and over and over over the last few weeks. False teachers, he says in, the first, in uh, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 16, Verses 17 and 18. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learn. Avoid them. Because such people do not serve our Lord Jesus, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. Man, I, I, I can't help but look at like some of the sermons that get preached in our world today at some of the biggest churches. It sounds exactly like that smooth talk and flattering words. People want to get up and say... God loves you so much. You are so valuable. You, you are so amazing. God is so lucky to have you. And they teach all these things, and at the end of it, you're like, I don't feel so good about myself. Nobody goes home from Joel Osteen's church and is like, I feel terrible. Everybody goes home feeling like, mm, that was a good pet talk. But that's all it is. And those kind of sermons, those sermons, those kind of sermonettes, they're not doing anything for anybody. That's why Paul writes and says, avoid that kind of people. Those kind of people. So he warns them about false teachers, and then also he writes to shore them up in the gospel. The, the book of Romans is a gospel book from beginning to end. He wants them to know the gospel. He says in chapter 1, 
verses 15 through 17. He says, So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. So that's why he wrote this church. He, he says, I want to commend your obedience to faith. I want to warn you about false teachers, and I want you to know the, the true gospel. Okay. I know I'm moving fast. I, I want to have time. We've got to go to a, at 6 o'clock, we have a business meeting, and I know you all are eager to stay for it and to be involved in the business of our church. So I've already written down your names, and if you're not there, it's, you know, <laughs> it's going to look real bad. I'm just not going to make it. But I love, I love the way our church does business meeting. I'm going to throw that out. It, they are so easy and calm. It is such a departure from the way that many churches do business meetings. Um, I said that one time in a pastor's group. I said, I love our church's business meetings. And I was almost cast out of the group for, for saying something like that. Well, so we looked at the book of Romans. That's, that's the book of Romans as a whole. Uh, I want to talk context of this verse, though. Because to just pull out a verse and say, everything in your life is going to work out fine. No matter what you're going through, don't worry. It'll work out fine. That's an incorrect usage of, of this text. And so I want to look at what this really means. First, I want to just talk a really short context, and then at the end, we're going to read lunch and, and kind of explore it as we go. So, first, let's read the context here, the, the short context, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. It's a, it's a very short context, but this is where it's immediately located in the text. Verse 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. Just if you if you are an underliner or a, a circler or a highlighter, the word "call" is going to be the key in this section to understand this. So, those who love God who are called according to His purpose, for those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers, brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also what? Called. That's that's where you connect. Verse 28, verse 30. Those who predestined, he also called. Those who called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Okay, so that is the context. This is the small context, but this is where we really understand what verse 28 is talking about. I have two points uh, for you this evening, and it's funny as you look at this, they're really, really long. I didn't give you blanks, I meant to, but uh, it's a really long sentence with just a tiny little thing. This verse, number one, this verse is not about your earthly life working out the way that you want it to. That's, that's the first point. This verse is not about your earthly life working out the way that you want it to. I want, the, I want to say this so clearly, that this verse is not about when you're going through a tough time, God looking at you and promising things will be okay. I, I know we want it to be that. And I know that, that that's, that's not a bad thing. We say that to people, right? When people are going through really, really tough times, isn't that one of the first things? It, does that ever make you feel better, though? When someone says, don't worry, it'll be okay, you're like, how do you know? Have you been in this situation before? I, I can't see that it could, because there are times when we can't. We look and we say, I can't see that this is going to work out. I can't see that this is going to work out for my good, whatever that means. So this verse is not about that. And that's, but that's the usual way that we look at this, to encourage believers that no matter what we're going through, the tough times, it, it's going to work out. Just trust, just trust the verse. It'll be, it'll be fine. The dark clouds will go away. Look at the silver lining in all things. Things will go back to normal. How many times have we looked? Now, this is a true statement, though. How many times have you looked back in your life and said, it did work? That's kind of what I was not pulled from this. The third thousand foot of Jesus yeah. is, is that it does work out. And, and, and that, that is yeah. uh, that's a great application. Because there are times that we look back and say, the things that I thought were massive problems didn't end up being so life-changing. The things that, that I thought would be the most important things didn't end up being that important. The, the, the problems that I used to have, it, it, they weren't as big as I thought. And so, and that's usually where we go. And that's not wrong because it does happen in life. But the problem is this is not a promise for that. Because there are times in our lives where things don't work out. I mean, there's times that you've, you've faced something where you maybe lost your job. And then you look and you're like, how did that work out for good? And maybe some long place in the future we can look back and say, well, that was for my good, but it doesn't always work out for, for the good of, of, uh, of what we think should be our good. It's not a sustainable promise every single time because life is terrible sometimes. 
I mean, you, th you think, I'm not going to get into specifics, but you think about uh, you, all the terrible things that happen in this world every second of every day. Like, kids are going hungry. They're going to bed hungry. They're, there's literally, there are children starving to death somewhere in this world. How is it working out for them? And I'm not being flippant with that. I'm saying, is that working out for their good? You can't. They're, we live in a sinful and broken world. And Paul is going to say that specific thing. That this world itself is groaning. It, 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 it's just roiling with anger. The, the brokenness that sin has brought into this world. And in those situations where things don't work out, who is to blame then? It's going to be one of two people. It's either God or yourself. And so that's why this cannot be a consistent promise where everything is always going to work out in the end. Because somebody is going to have to be to blame for the things that don't work out very well. So this verse is not about your earthly life working out how you want it. Number two, this verse is about your spiritual life working out exactly as God intends it to. Your spiritual life working out exactly as God intends it to. Because you see in verse 28 through 30, if you, if you see it in your, your Bible, does your Bible show paragraphs? Like, is there, is there a, a, a section where it's indented, where you can see that this is the start of a new paragraph? I'm going to teach you a really fun Bible word, or seminary word. It's not found in the Bible. The, the little paragraphs we see are called pericopes. Um, it's spelled like the word pericope. Um, and if you say that in a theology class, you will get made fun. If you pronounce it like a pericope. Um, and then people will really look at you like you don't know what you're talking about. True story. Um, but it's called a pericope, this little paragraph. It means that everything located inside this little grouping is all in the same topic. It's all moving in the same direction. That's why if you read the book of Proverbs, every single verse is a new, is a new paragraph because they have nothing in common with the verses around it. But so you can't divorce verse 28 from verses 29 and 30. You can't take God promises good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You can't take that from he foreknew, though, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And he, those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. This is not talking about your earthly life. This is talking about your salvation. This is talking about what Christ is doing in you, what God the Father did in you, in your heart, before the world was even created. He knew you. And this is a truth that is going to separate people in Christianity from one side to the other. Because there's going to be people who, who embrace this, and there's going to be people who say, well, it was 100% my choice. I came to Jesus just because one day I decided I needed to come to Jesus. It does not happen like that. Nobody ever woke up and said, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, nobody ever woke up and said, I'm a sinner who needs to save. It doesn't happen. The book of Romans says there is no one who is righteous. No one seeks after God. And so what we need, if that's the truth, then we need God to do something for us that we can't do for ourselves. And that's what this verse is teaching. God, through the ages of time, He knew you individually. He knew you before you were born. Jeremiah said before I was in my mother's womb, He knew me. He knew me. He had ordained me already to be a prophet. So this is talking about salvation. Now we can fight and debate about this all night about what it means, this, this, well, well let's, we'll, we'll go, we'll go into this, let's, I don't want to fight with it, I just want to, I want to go through scripture. But this, this is what he's ordained you to be, when it's talking about that, that he's working all things towards your good, what is that good? Because the identity of that good is what's going to determine how you interpret this passage. The identity of this good is so that you be conformed to the image of his son. That's what this is about. Yes, that, that is exactly what this is about. This isn't about your debt disappearing or your diagnosis being uh, you know, wrong or, or, or any other thing, your prodigal coming home. Those are all significant prayers that are tough and we want those things to work out. But this is talking about your relationship with God the Father. And this is the amazing thing about this. The strength of your relationship with God is not dependent on the strength of your devotional life. Uh, the, the, the strength of your the desire to please him. He says here in verse 29, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Your growth in faith and your sanctification, your, your being conformed to the image of Christ in you, it's not based on your strength, it's based on God's strength. 
If you're a true child of God, you will grow. I do not believe that anybody will get to heaven and say, I never grew from the day that I, that I accepted Christ as my Savior. Nobody. The Bible doesn't. The, the Bible never talks positively, positively about a person who, who doesn't grow in their faith. Jesus gives example of different kinds of soil. You know, in, in his parable, he talks about soil that is in hard packed soil where birds come and they take it away before it grows roots. That's an unbeliever. He talks about soil that grows up in, in parched ground and it has no, it can't grow roots. That, again, unbeliever. He talks about soil that uh, that when a plant grows. There is uh, the, the vines and, and thorns encircle it, and it dies. That, again, is un an unbeliever. The only believer that Jesus is talking about is the one that grows fruit. 20-fold, 30-fold, 100-fold, whatever he says. So when you look at this, I, I love this should be so encouraging to you that even though we fail constantly in our relationship with Christ, and our walk with him, and we go through a week and say, I didn't open my Bible this week. I didn't pray like I was supposed to. I can't do this. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. We come so many times with that mentality. I'm sorry, Lord. Listen, if he foreknew you, he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. That's his promise. That's a much better promise than God's going to work things out for me. The, and I wrote this, and I, and I want you to see. I intentionally made this you know, grammatically incorrect. That good that he's talking about, the goodest good that we're ever going to get it, the gooder than good, the good is good, is that we be conformed to the image of His Son. And that happens because God the Father knew you and loved you, chose you in Christ Jesus. He conforms you to the image of His Son. He called you, He justified you, and He will glorify you. The, the, the greatest good that we will ever have is the fact that one day we'll be free from this body of sin. That's, that's what this is all aiming toward. All of chapter 8 is moving us toward this truth. That here in this world we will have trouble. But because Jesus has promised us a life beyond this world, that's, that's that good that he is moving us toward. It's not about earthly good. And you'll see this constantly in the verses that get taken out of context. They're all about you and your, your best life now. Every one of these verses, people, these false teachers, they want so desperately for you to have things now. To have a positive life, to have the wealth, to have the health, to have all the things in this life. But listen, the whole core of the Bible is the fact that it's pushing us toward the truth that this world is not where our focus should be. Paul told the church at Colossae, he said, set your mind on things above, not on things below. I think about this often as you look at the story of Peter when he walked on water. When his eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was able to literally break the laws of physics. But what happened when he put his eyes on his circumstances? It's the same thing in our lives. When we look around in my world, if, if my goal is always, how do I make this better? How do I make this better? How, how is God going to bring good into this? We miss the focus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the one that called you, equips you, conforms you. It doesn't start with us. It always starts with Him. There, there's not one person that will be in heaven that says, I earned my salvation, or I prayed hard enough, or I wanted it bad enough. Every single person is going to come. And then you sing the song uh, frequently. They, they, how would you come? By the way of the cross. Every single person comes by that same way. And so I wanted to, that, that's going to be how we're going to frame this in context. Now verses 29-30, I won't miss this. They present one of the most significant theological teachings in all of Scripture. This is, we could park here, uh, we can park our motorhomes here and spend the, the rest of our lives just cruising through this. This is called the golden chain of salvation because of the five links, uh, the five chain links that are represented here. He foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and he glorified. Now, we can argue about this. This is the part where we can fight and debate. Uh, there's going to be people probably in this room on different sides of the aisle. There's going to be people on one side that say, I had no part in my salvation. I made no choice. God saved me regardless. He, I was born to be saved, and there are people who are born not to be saved. There's people on the other side who say, I, I responded. They use the, the words of, I, I chose, I responded, uh, I, I reacted, I asked Jesus to save me, I received him. People on this side would say, you didn't do any of that. Christ captured you, and you may have surrendered, and that's, and that's it. Th that's outside the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here. And I, I feel like this is an unnecessary argument anyway, because the way... That, 
The way how people get saved, to me, is less important that they come to faith in Christ Jesus. I, I hope that doesn't look like a cop-out, because we will talk about this frequently. You cannot ignore in Scripture that God foreknew and predestined us. You can't, you can't, you just, you can't look and say that one day you woke up and wanted Christ and, and got Christ. That, that, and even the phrase asking Jesus in your heart or, or receiving Christ, I, I, I have issues with those things as if Christ is some impotent deity that he's looking and waiting for your permission. And I've heard that frequently. Well, God's a gentleman. He won't impose his will on anybody. Tell that to, to Saul on the road to Damascus. That I, at the end of the day, did Saul have a choice? I guess. But his choice would have been blindness and being forsaken for the rest of his life, or new life and new purpose in Christ Jesus. So we, there's, there's a road here, and I think this is one of those things we can debate on forever. In my, my first, uh, one of my first theology classes in school, Soteriology 101, that's the doctrine of salvation. I mean, people literally, toward the end of the semester, sat on opposite sides of the room, depending on which side of the debate they fell on. And they debated and they fought. And so I'm sitting there, and, I, and in my ministry, I've been on one side, I've been on the other, I've migrated as, 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 I, as I feel led in the scripture, uh, as I learn new arguments, I, I look and say, oh wow, that, that's, that's a really good explanation. And then I read another book and I say, oh, but that's a really good explanation. So again, uh, <laughs> looking at all of this, I, I don't want you to be people of opinions. I want you to be people of the Word. Go to the Word and let the Holy Spirit teach you and, and land on where your convictions will stay. I, I don't want to give any more than that. I, I don't want to say one side or the other. He is, the best thing about this, and, and the point of this as we look at verses 28 through 30, before I start to get lost in the weeds, is this. He is the guarantee of your relationship it's not based on the strength of your faith. It is not based on uh, the, the, the power of the argument that led you to give your heart to Christ. It's, it's, it's not about you feeling saved. He is the guarantee. It says that those he foreknew, the ones that he knew would be his own, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. So your relationship with Christ is not based on your strength. That should give you so much peace. That you can come before the Father, whatever's in your heart, and He'll say, my relationship with you isn't based on your deeds. It's based on what Christ did for you. He, that's why He can invite us boldly into the throne of grace. You know how crazy that is? That, that whoever wrote that, I, I don't know who it was, but whoever wrote that to the Hebrews said, come boldly before God's throne. The Jews didn't know any, any of that kind of relationship with God. Their relationship with Him was one of fear. That if they walked into the holy place, or into the most holy place, without being the, the high priest on the day of atonement, young or poor, if they did that, they'd be struck dead. Remember, Uzzah in the Old Testament touched the ark of God, and he fell down dead. That was their relationship with God. Now God says, because I love you, and because of what Christ did for you, my people can come to me like, like a son to a father. Run into, run into my arms. And so I wanted to see this in context. Romans 8, 28, in context. Not talking about your earthly life and all the things that we want to work out for you. It's about your spiritual life. That ultimately it worked out exactly how Christ wanted because he called you into a relationship with him and you responded to it. So now what I want to do, we still got a couple minutes. What I want to do is I want to read some more context. And we'll give some notes along the way, but I'm going to read a ton. So just be prepared. Uh, we're, we're just going to march right through because Paul, this is the most significant theological section, I think, in all of the scripture. So I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to go and go and go. If you have questions, uh, just uh, shout out and stop me. But Romans, we'll start in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. I want you to see all of this. It, Paul is not giving random arguments. All of this is moving toward one goal. So in Romans 7, 24, he starts this and he says, What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? He's talking about sin in his life. He said, who will, who will rescue me from this sin? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Man, I want to read more than that. I'm going to go back. Go back to verse 21. So I discovered this law. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote so much of the New Testament. He's probably one of the greatest Christians that we could ever look at. He says, I discovered this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present within me. 
or in my inner self, I delight in God's law and says, I, I want to be a good believer. But I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. He's saying that I want to be a good Christian, but something in me is warring against that. He says, What's a, what a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? What's the answer to that, church? Jesus, and he says it in verse 25, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind and myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. That's the battle every Christian faces. We want to do what is right, and the Holy Spirit's calling us to do what is right, teaching us how to do what is right, and Christ has conformed us to the image of his Son so that we can be doing what is right, but it's still an impossibility until we're free from this body of sin. Okay? I love what uh, John Owen, one of the greatest theologians of all time, he said, to mortify sin, to kill sin, is not to utterly kill it, root it out, and destroy it, that it should have no more hold nor residence in our hearts. It's true that this is what's aimed at. Like that's what we should be trying for, but this is not in this life to be accomplished. Now, he wrote that in the 1600s, so obviously it was a different, eloquent age. But he's saying, if, if your goal is to kill sin in this life, that's a good goal, but know that it's never going to happen. Because we, we are sinners by our nature. We're, our, our bodies are condemned by sin. That's what Paul is saying. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, remember, when we see the word therefore, what do we do? We ask it. What it's there for. Therefore, because of that, because of the war that's happening in our hearts, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Why is there no condemnation for me, even though I want to do sin? Because Jesus paid for it. He died for us. There's no condemnation for me because Christ became a condemnation. He faced it all for me. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. You could never earn it. He's saying you could never earn your salvation, but God did it for you. He earned it for you. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful death, as a sinful flesh, as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God did something for you that you could not do for yourself. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. That's he's saying. People who are not believers in Christ, they literally, they can't do what's right. Because in them, they're, they're ruled by their, their own sin. But those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh. But if in the spirit, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if you're a believer, you're different. You're of a different quality than this world. You, you exist on a different, with a different nature. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to you. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. I know that we are going through so this is a mountain of theology. I, I, and I, we're not going to be able to touch on everything. I want to give you big picture. Paul is saying there's a war inside you between what's sinful and what's right. But the Holy Spirit is your confirmation that you have been called by God into a life of faith. And one day, he says, we will be free from this body of sin. We won't have to deal with this anymore if we are in Christ Jesus. So then, my brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's, that's an encouragement for you to live in godliness, to walk with Christ Jesus. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may be glorified with the church. Oh, I wish I could talk through this. This is so important. He's saying, listen, you, you may have been born a sinner, but Christ, when he, when he redeemed you, He gives you something greater than the things that this world can offer. The, the things that, that work out for your good, that we want it to be good. Listen, they pale in comparison to the fact that as sinners we can call God our Father. Our 
Father. We can run to Him, and the Spirit inside us testifies with us and reminds us of who we are. In verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. Now Paul is digging at his point here. His point is, this world and the sinful parts of it are going to fade. But there is something better waiting for the believer. For the creation, the world around us, eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility. That just means it was cursed along with us. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. I love that phrase. The, the earth was like when Adam and Eve sinned, the earth was like, really? I get cursed? Like the earth, I didn't do anything. And, and, and you did it, you messed it up. Not, I would, it says not willingly, not, the earth didn't participate in it. But it, he was, it was subjected to Adam's sin and the curse. In the hope, in verse 21, that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. This is going to be, it, this is going to be realized finally, consummated finally, at the end of the book of Revelation. We see in chapters 21 and 22 that God will do away with this world that's broken by sin and will recreate a new world. For, verse 22, for we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves. We know that this world is not the end. We know that this is not it. We know that there's something better. We groan because we still struggle with sin, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. He's saying now we're going to struggle with sin because it's only our souls that have been saved. But one day God will rescue and redeem and, and transform our bodies. Now in this hope, verse 24, we were saved. But hope that is not seen, hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? But now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. He's saying one day. If you're patient for this, if you believe this, if you grow in godliness, if you walk toward Him because the Spirit's in you, God will enable you to grow. And you'll see this all come to pass. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Because we do not know what, we want, what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And He who searches our hearts knows the minds of the Spirit because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus is with us in receiving the Spirit is with us and receiving even when we don't have the words to say. In verse 28, we know that all things work out together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. Do you see that this is the this is like the culmination of this argument that he's been making. He's been saying, what a wicked person that I am. And even though I'm, I'm, I'm a believer, I still struggle with sin. And what do I do? And, and the Spirit, even, he helps me in my weakness. But, but the final culmination of this is that we know this is going to work for the good of those who love God. And this is how? Because he's going to redeem our bodies from dead. And then verse 31, what then are we to say about these things? What else is there to say? If God is for us, who can be against us? The sin that's born in your heart, it is no match for the Savior. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not with him also grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So the time that your sin condemns you and accuses and, and Satan stands before you and points out your sin, you can say, I am one of God's elect. He chose me in Christ Jesus. He is conforming me to the image of His Son, that my sin has no hold over me. Who is the one who condemns? Verse 34. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He's at the right hand of God, and He intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Because as, as it's written, because of you, we're being put to death all day long. We're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all of these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is the argument that Paul was trying to make. And I know that was a lot of scripture and we could spend so long here. But listen, that's the argument he's trying to make. The, 
good of those who love God and who are called according to His purpose, that's the good. That there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Because your, your relationship with Him, your, your, your position before Him in salvation is not based on your works, but on His love and mercy and grace towards sinners like us. That, I, know, I know that we didn't get to go into tremendous depth. Or you maybe felt like that was way too deep for one single sermon. But that wasn't the scope of this. I really wanted you to just see how Romans 8.28 fits into the whole scheme of this chapter. I want to give you kind of more of a, a broad overview. What we're going to see week by week as we look at these different verses in context they're so much better they're so much better than the temporary pleasures that this world wants to give them when you look at this verse and it just says hey everything's going to work out just trust God that, that's such a vain and shallow promise because maybe things won't work out in this life but that's okay that's Paul's argument if it doesn't that's fine because we have a life to come where we will enjoy Christ for all eternity and, and it's not based on what we've done it's based on how Christ loved his church now in the future, when you hear somebody, when you hear someone say, if somebody's going through a rough time and you hear the words, but all things will work out, you can be like, okay, yeah, let me talk about that. Now at a funeral or something like that, don't do that. Don't, uh, don't start bringing up these kind of things. But, but seriously, I, I want to give tools so we can look at scripture. And, and, and that's the, the best way, I, I say the single best way that we can discover context, whatever verse you're looking at, read the entire chapter. Look, look at the whole thing. Look at the whole thing because it's going to teach us way more that we can by just pulling a verse out of context. And Father, I love you, Lord. We love you. We're so grateful. I wish I could, I wish I could have spent way more time here, but Lord, we know that we'll get here eventually, and, and we know, Lord, the truth doesn't change. So whether we touch on this now or in 10 years, it's, it's still going to be the truth, that you love your people, that even though we go through the fire, you're with us. You're walking with us. You're groaning with us. You are interceding for us. You're guiding us through it, not so that our troubles would disappear, but so that the, the Savior would appear before our eyes and be the focus of, of our lives. I thank you for Christ Jesus, who gave us not only the example to follow, but also the, the pathway to reconciliation with God. I thank you, Lord, for Christ and what he did for me. I was a sinner, and I, there was no way I was going to choose you. But you called me out of my sin and shame in the Holy Spirit did a work in me that I cannot explain. But my, my presence right here now, Lord, is testimony to the fact that you, you saved me, and I pray that it would be, with my dying breath every day, would be to proclaim your gospel. Thank you for this, this group of people, Lord. I, I, I pray for special blessings for the faith that was on Sunday night, and I pray as we walk through this day, they'd be encouraged to, uh, Lord, walk even deeper into the Romans. Uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name.